This is our last conversation with Shannon Flynn. In this episode, we'll talk about Mark Hoffman's lawyer, Ron Yengich. Ron has defended some of Utah's most notorious criminals. We'll talk about the plea bargain in which Ron was able to plea bargain down to second degree murder rather than first degree murder. How did that come about? We'll also ask, why doesn't Mark grant interview requests? Check out our conversation. But before we do that, I just want to mention our subscribe button once again. If you'd like to get a copy of this episode as soon as it's released, if you'll subscribe for $10 a month, I'll not only give you this episode, but every episode every, or every month, a transcript. So we'll give you the entire transcript for just $10 per month. If you would like to subscribe for $15 a month, I'll make sure you're the first one to receive the printed copy of this interview. So once again, if you'll help us subscribe, we'll be able to put forth some documentaries. We'll include people like Kurt Bench, um, George Throckmorton, who's coming up soon, uh, as well as uh, Sandra Tanner, who knows Mark Hoffman as well. So once again, please subscribe. Now back to our conversation. I think he still harbors an idea that he'll get out someday, and I believe that's what drives most of his denials of talking to anybody, you know, corresponding with news people or, or anything like that. Oh, um, so you think that he doesn't want to do interviews because he wants to still get out? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. See, his attorney was Ron Yangich, and Ron Yangich also defended the uh, Ogden Hi-Fi murderers, uh, Shelby and whatever, I can't remember. Um, uh, in things that they had said in prison, speaking when they shouldn't have, uh, n not being careful, was, were used against them in their commutation hearings and, and their death. I mean, and then, you know, when they made appeals for commutation of sentence or to have the death penalty removed. And so Ron instructed him carefully, do not talk about your crimes, do not give any new information, because that information could be then used against you you know, if he ever come up for parole. And so he has taken that seriously and, and rarely, if ever, you know, says what he did. I think that handwritten thing to the parole board is far and away the most complete and comprehensive and as honest as you could get of him really confessing up to what he did. But I believe a careful reading of that would reveal nothing that was not already known. So, um, now you mentioned Ron Yengich. You said that he even lied to him. Evidently he did to begin with. Told him, no, I didn't do any of this stuff. Didn't force, didn't kill those people. I don't know if Ron believed that. I mean, Ron's way too smart. <laughs> Has been around this way too long to not, you know. So, I mean, do you know what happened? Now, oh, but, and I, but I would have to say that at some point then Ron did figure it out or he was told because then, uh, then they went into the plea bargain negotiations because going to trial, well, for both sides, and I should say something about that right now, I think Mark got as harsh of a sentence that he would have gotten had he gone to trial. I don't believe a death penalty would have ever been agreed on with a jury because he had no priors. I mean, he just, you know, he just didn't fit that kind of multiple offender sort of thing. Now, the crimes were callous, heinous, and multiple, maybe, but I don't believe. So if that had not been the case, he would have just gotten life in prison. Well, he's got that anyway. Um, uh, well, see, now I can't remember what it was. But anyway, I, I think the sentence, I think Ron did as good a job for him as he could have done because I don't believe the prosecutors would have accepted anything less than at least the possibility of life in prison. And he only had that on one of the counts. The way that plea bargain actually worked, he pled guilty on four counts. Two counts of murder and two counts of uh, theft by deception. And in the plea agreement, they agreed to dismiss all other counts that they had brought and federal counts on the machine gun and, and something about the, 
Library of Congress I read. So they dismissed all the rest of that so that the only thing that would pinned against him was the Utah charges and staying in Utah State Prison. And, and unless something really strange happens, he will have ended up getting a life sentence. But obviously at some point, then Ron said, well, obviously you did this. So we don't want to go to trial, so let's see what we can do. And I was told some, a couple of years later, it was actually at a Christmas party that Ron Yangich and Bob Stott were at. And they kind of just stepped to the side and said, okay, what if he pleads guilty? Well, they kind of hammered out the basic idea right there. Well, because the interesting thing is, because I know you, you told me before we started recording that, that he had lied to, you, he said, there's the person you don't lie to is your lawyer. <laughs> but he had lied to, to Ron Yangich and said he didn't do it. Um, I guess what's interesting is I know that there was a, a confession to a nurse, or I don't know if it was to the nurse, but she had overheard something that sounded like he had, he had admitted to it. Uh -huh. And I know that Ron Yangich got that suppressed. Oh, man. He went ape. He went ballistic in making sure that information never, you know, saw the light of day. Now, to this day, I still don't know what he said. It's very odd. I, I, I since he's in prison, I wonder if the nurse, if he could ever find her, if she would say. Yeah, that would be. We'd all love to know, wouldn't we? <laughs> what is it that he said? that because what happened was that she did not mention it. There was a policeman standing by, but he couldn't hear it. But he could see that he had waved to her and then he was speaking like to her ear. And so man, he went, what is he saying? And that's where it all arose from. And then uh, Ron found, found out about that because Ron had, when he was in the hospital, Oh, and here's another story. Wow. Um, Mark's in the hospital, and I go up there to LDS Hospital like, oh, the day after, two days after at the most. And his family, his wife is up there, and again, I'm like up there, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is crazy, and we all believe Mark has just been a victim. And well, Ron Yangich and his partner Brad Rich came over while I was there. I spent one half of a day there, about four hours. And they came in, and so they had been retained, and it was somebody in the hospital that told Mark Hoffman's dad, you need to call Ron Yankich. That's the, that's the person to get, because they didn't know anything about criminal lawyers or, you know, that's the person you need to get. And so they called him and he came over. And so he was just brand new to this and just like, okay, what is going on? And he started asking questions. And again, Ron is not dumb. Very probing questions about who Mark was and what his you know, personality was and so on and so forth. And I was the one that had to sit there and tell in front of his wife and parents, Mark's total atheist, hasn't believed in the church in years. So not only is their son, husband blown up, you know, um, dying, they get to hear that all of his church stuff is just out the window. Nuts. But he was at the hospital a lot. And so when he heard that man, he raced immediately and claimed doctor client, uh, doctor patient privilege. And that was the sticking point. Had it been a medical doctor that he was whispering or talking to, there wouldn't have been any fight. But the nurse, did she qualify? Well, he successfully argued that that, that umbrella stretches wide enough to include an emergency room nurse. A CNA or something, maybe not, but an emergency room nurse. But to this day, he may have just said, my leg hurts. We don't know. The assumption is that be, because someone said he wanted a tape recorder because he wanted to say something because he thought he was going to die. Yeah. I really think he was going to die? I don't know. I don't know. And for all we know, it was going to be, I think I'm going to die. I didn't do any of this stuff. We don't know that it would have been a confession to Grimes. We assume so, but that may not have been true. 
All right. Well, um, I think I'm out of questions finally. Do you, is there anything that I've missed? Is there, is there anything you want to add to, to this story? Uh, no, not, not in particular. I mean, we could just go on forever. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you have to do part two or something. Yeah, we might have to do a part two. So you've got some interesting documents. Um, I've taken a few pictures oh, of some of them. I can say something because this has bothered me forever. Uh, I have heard people, I've seen surveys done where people have left the LDS church and they rank, you know, what was the number one thing that made you leave, number two, number three. And I've seen it where there's a list of 20 things. It always amazes me when I see Mark Hoffman bombings or whatever mentioned. And I have thought, why would that make you leave the church? And then eventually I got it that it put people off because they could not understand why the general authorities did not detect somehow that he was untruthful or these were forgeries or whatever. Well, I just recently reread re a talk that Dallin Oaks gave at BYU, I think in 1987 or 90, yeah, 87, where he talked about that a little bit. But being in the position that he is, I don't think he was able to tell the real reason. His reasoning, what he said was, is that we don't go into transactions with people suspecting everybody. We try to have a good attitude and, you know, assume that not everybody's out to get us. And so we went into it with the same, we're not naturally suspicious or naturally think everybody's bad. And that's true, but that was true for everybody. No one, Kurt Bench, anybody, uh, Brent Ashworth, I mean, Brent Ashworth had been done, dealt very badly by Mark. I mean, he had been promised things and Mark didn't come through and he had sold things to other people or he had been promised. And so he had had a number of bad dealings with Mark. But still, he still did business with him and still, you know, and still considered him somewhat, you know, friendly. Uh, so everybody was that way. But I think what he was unable to say is, those guys don't have magic powers. And people in the church want to believe that. Unfortunately, they're taught that. Church education system is one of the worst offenders. They, I've actually seen written in books where they're talking about general authorities and use the phrase, they can see around corners. That is not true. That is not true in any shape or form. But if you're told that when you're 14 years old and going to seminary, you, you believe it. And you keep believing that your whole life. It's not true. They have no more ability to detect a murderer in front of them or a forger or anything else than anybody else does. They have the same capacity to look and investigate and think about things and think about things rationally, you know, than anybody else does. But the thought that they can just cock their ear and Jesus will tell them and if that becomes the reason you quit the church I think it's one of the dumbest reasons on earth anyway thank you I feel better now all right well thanks I really appreciate you uh, spending some time here on gospel tangents and uh, uh, I hope things go well and, and uh, I we'll, we'll see I may have to call you again and we'll talk about this some more sure. <laughs> All right, thanks again. Okay. I want to thank Shannon Flynn for spending so much time for talking with us about Mark Hoffman. Shannon, I really appreciate you doing this. In our next conversation, I'd like to introduce Ann Wilde. She's an expert on modern day polygamy, having been a polygamist herself, being married to a man by the name of Ogden Kraut. We'll talk about the beginnings of modern Mormon polygamy practices, how the split with the LDS Church happened and that sort of thing. He was approached about signing a manifesto of some sort in 1886 in order to get kind of the government off our back, so to speak. And in the process, he received a re this revelation. It's only a one page, uh, relatively short, but it said in there that the Lord would not change an eternal principle or an everlasting covenant. Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.